What I want to do this evening is uh, give an introduction to parables of the Bible. Won't necessarily examine any of them, but I certainly want to see the biblical um, position for them, why Jesus uh, used parables as often as he did. And uh, the, the reason why he uses them, we'll see in a moment, and likely you're in good understanding of this on the front end of things is different, I think, than how many people will want to excuse why he taught in parables. But let's do this. Let's get a background for the word parable um, in Webster's great dictionary. He gives us the definition, its origins, uh, its Latin origins. It, 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 in, in, the, in Webster's dictionary, he also gives the Greek origins for this. But our English word <clears throat> parable is, is in these three forms, which essentially you can see what the, uh, where, where the, the term parable fits for us. But it, to throw forward or against, to compare, uh, to or against, to compare, to set together, or one thing with another. That's kind of wordy, I think. But certainly if you take a moment to study the, what, what's being said, you get it. There's intent to make comparison of. There's intent to show these two opposites, but yet how they may have uh, uh, agreement with each other for the story's sake. A parable is also uh, could, could be understood as a fable or an allegory. Uh, in, in showing the representation or the relationship of the two, you know, something real with something fictitious, and the fictitious being the vehicle of the teaching to make the comparison or the analogy uh, to that which is real, that which is familiar. We, we see and we have, um, I don't know if you remember when we were going through the judges, we actually right in the middle of the, of the judges uh, in chapter 9, there is a parable. It's not the first parable that's recorded in Scripture, but it certainly is a parable that's there. And it's a parable where the, the author of the book of Judges wants to show the, the, the foolishness of, of how men think that they are in control of everything. And, and he does so by saying, look, the trees in the fields don't even do this. They don't, they don't select a lead tree. They all know who God is and they all serve their own purpose. So it's a, it's, it's a fictitious story. Uh, obviously, trees don't talk. And, uh, and, and the intent is to use the, the satire of that event to speak to something in a striking way, to get, get the attention of the listener. A second Samuel chapter 12, Nathan chooses the vehicle of a parable or a story to get David's attention about the sin that he's committed against God and Bathsheba and the nation as a whole as well. But he, it's the, the intentionality to use this story, not to entertain, but to, to make a striking statement. Uh, and then as well, it is, a parable is, a, is a, it, it represented by fiction, or in my fable. Uh, I think it would be, be beneficial to know that certainly there's analogies, metaphors, fables, parables. Uh, they're, they're by nature, fables are more short and maybe more in paragraph form. And a, a, a moral is being taught here. You could take the book of Proverbs. It is essentially a collection of fables or parables or wise sayings where people understand that when you're saying this, you're meaning this, and you make a, a connection to the two. You're, 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 you're intentionally making this uh, in this light. Uh, an analogy, uh, perhaps a bit longer than a metaphor, um, maybe more in the, in the short story type of a format, a, uh, a, 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 a metaphor, an, excuse me, an analogy again would be even somewhat re related to comparing something that one generation understands but needs to be communicated so that two different generations can understand the same thing. So in, in making references to tabs on a folder would speak to one particular 
age of the, of the congregation or the listener and to speak of the URL would speak to another population of the congregation. So we could do its test right now and see who knows what a URL is and who knows what a tab on a folder is. Well, because I've already set you up, they're essentially the same thing. The URL is a website idea, a web website title. I'm getting into really risky territory for me, who's technically mm, a little on the verge of things and, uh, and then organizingly, my, my, my way of organizing things is really confusing. So you, you get this. But a URL is a way of systematically or intentionally categorizing where information is stored on a computer or a, a, on the Internet. Where the old school file cabinet you go to, you open it up and everything is, if they've done their good job al alphabetically in order, you want to know where this information is, you go to that tab and you grab it and you pull out the file. And there's a wealth of information behind that tab. Well, that's essentially uh, a way that you would take two different uh, examples that two different groups of people might understand at different levels and bring them into the same position for the understanding. So it's comparing, it's putting this against this and actually in showing that they're similar or the same. So the, and then, then from, from metaphor to analogy, uh, one can then say, well, you know, an, an allegory, um, you, you move from short story into the prose or the, 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 the novels, fictitious novels that have been written in, in the past. And so you move into a much more detailed story that has characters who are fictitious characters, obviously, made, and even given names of things that you and I would relate to. And they're a character in the story. And that character in the story is going to unfold that particular characteristic or that particular moral or that particular uh, issue. Great examples of this is John Bunyan's, perhaps one of the best allegorical writings of all times. That's my opinion. Um, and, and, and certainly you would be familiar with his, his allegory, Pilgrim's Progress. And uh, his lesser known, my argument, his better allegory is the Holy War. Um, both of these written by John Bunyan. If, if you've never read either one of them, do yourself a favor. And uh, if you're going to choose between the two, hear my appeal to you, even though Pilgrim's Progress is the more popular, m my argument be go read The Holy War or read the condensed, shortened kid's story called The War for Mansell. Uh, it is updated into a more modern English and a little bit easier to read, but a great little story. Every character, every person in the story has a, has a lesson to teach throughout the story. So the, and I can't remember who the mayor of the story is, but Lord Conscience is a man who lives in the city and, and uh, Mr. Morality is in the, is in the house. And there's, it's just a great analogy. And it's a long story that has these characters teaching essentially. So it's using a fictitious position, fictitious place, fictitious people to teach something that is real and uh, helpful. So you have, you have fables, you have metaphors, you have analogies, all of these being helpful. Not, one could say that a parable is, it could be any collection, short paragraph, simple little statement, short story, or a larger novel uh, on, on uh, the John Bunyan scale of life. So those are, the, the, those are historic liter pieces of literature and forms of literature, I should say, in, in, uh, that describe what a parable is. Let's at least acknowledge this. We've already acknowledged two parables in the Old Testament, out of Judges and 2 Samuel. Um, I, don't, I, I can't say this absolutely, but in, in trying to do some uh, searching through my, my Logos Bible program, um, just trying to find out everything that could be classified as a parable in the Bible, uh, we'll certainly see that number, Numbers chapter 23 uh, shows us, at, at least in my earlier searches, that this is a parable from Balaam. Balaam's not the parable, but he tells a parable 
uh, concerning the Moabites and the Israelites. Uh, again, the trees choosing a king parable. Um, wanting, wanting the nation of Israel who wants a king so badly to say, listen, the trees, the, you, you're, being, you're acting more foolish than the trees of the, of the forest behave. You want a king, the trees don't behave like this. The parable is essentially, go be like the trees. Trust God to be your leader. Well, the, the intent is that that would be a striking moment in the, in the idea of the listener. Um, Samson, another parable in the book of Judges, he, he, it's, it's, a, it's a story. It's more of a, of a, of a tricking kind of a, it's, it's a more of a, uh, oh, the word just came and slipped right out of my mind. When you're telling, uh, you're trying to trick somebody, you're, you're, you, you've, you've got a, well, whatever that word is, you know what I'm saying. If you don't, just go ahead and help me get over it and say, sure, Paul, go ahead. Get on with it. Uh, a riddle. That was, that was the difficult word I was trying to come up with. A riddle. But it could be a parable as well. The, where the, the intent of, of telling this is to communicate something. Well, there's other parables in the Old Testament. Uh, we, some we're familiar with, others not so much. Ezekiel certainly utilizes the value of the parable, perhaps more than any other Old Testament uh, author or, or prophet. Um, let's, the, we, we will study a few of these Old Testament parables over the next several months. We won't look at all of them, but we'll, we'll, make stu we'll become students and study several of these over the next coming months throughout the summer. Uh, but primarily, we'll want to get quickly to the New Testament, because really, this is where the parable is on display. This is where the parable is essentially used to its highest value and its benefit, and that's in Jesus's teachings. And so Jesus's use of parables, uh, arguably, on the flip side there, there are, there are 46 different parables that Jesus is referred that, that, that scriptures refer to Jesus teaching some of them very short other the others of them uh, when I say long not certainly not in the length of, of a John Bunyan but more probably classified as a fable uh, or a shorter condensed story sometimes Jesus has spent more time explaining the parable than he actually does in the teaching of the parable but uh, again we won't look at all 46 of these parables but we will look at, at several of them. Some of them are very short, and we'll, we'll be able to use, uh, you notice some of these are even clumped in together, where essentially this parable, this parable, this parable, and this parable are all teaching the same thing. And so we'll, we, we may use four parables to teach the same, uh, the same topic rather than look at all four in one particular case or look at, at two of another. Um, but... Uh, Anyway, the, the, Jesus's use of parables. Well, if you'll go with me to the New Testament, to the book of Matthew, chapter 13. <clears throat> this is very, very interesting. Jesus, there, there is value in being a skilled storyteller. And you know what I mean by a skilled storyteller. There are some people that you're at a campfire and you just want, you, you just want that person to tell the story. Because he's going to be animated, he's going to get everybody into the story, and he's going to be successful in delivering the punchline, and he's going to get it all there. So there is something to be said about a skilled storyteller. Uh, I don't want to put Jesus as simply just a skilled storyteller. There's no, there, there's no mistaking, though, Jesus was a skilled storyteller. But, I, but hear me. That's not all he was. That's not really what he's even trying to be known as. He doesn't want to be a skilled storyteller so everyone knows, oh, I love it when Jesus tells a story. It's just good when he tells it. Another guy can tell the same story, but I don't want to hear him. I want to hear Jesus tell the story. Well, Jesus did command that kind of audience from the hearer, but not necessarily everybody appreciated what Jesus was doing in telling the story. It's important, and we'll see this, that Scripture really is the best place for us to, to, to understand why Jesus is going to teach and use um, 
so so skillfully and so successfully in the, in the use of the story, the parable. Uh, Jesus, one, one could make arguments that, yes, he was a good storyteller, but again, he didn't tell stories to entertain. So I think that's important. Whenever we, when we get to the study of the parables and the elements of the, of the parable, that it's important that we're not interpreting the reason Jesus used parables was to entertain people so then he could turn around and teach them something. In other words, to use the story as the attraction and then to teach them something unrelated to the story. Many in, many, many in the modern world make argument that Jesus' skilled storytelling ways is reason why pastors and preachers ought to use lots of illustrations and use uh, use these things to attract people to hear, whether it's related to the sermon or not, whether it's related to the text or not. Their argument is if they'll hear a good story while the preacher's speaking, then, then they'll hear something, perhaps they'll hear something of value. This is not, and let me, let me repeat this, this is not why Jesus used parables to entertain people. It is not. The scripture shows us this. And we'll see that when we when we look at Matthew chapter 13. He, he really wants his listeners to learn about God. He wants them to learn about the kingdom of God. The majority of these parables are teachings about the kingdom of heaven. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and he wants people to know who the son of God is. And he wants them to see who they are in the story, in relationship to the son of God, in relationship to the kingdom of God. Jesus wants the hearer to see themselves as the story is unfolding and how it relates to them. So some of the stories will have, some of these parables have a touch of satire in them. Again, there's value in, in what's being done, but again, the purpose is not so that every, everyone goes home talking about, oh, that was such a funny little ditty he told us today. That was so funny when, when, when Jesus cracked that good little joke really captured everyone and everyone got it at the same moment don't you love it when everybody gets it at the same moment well, i do which arguably doesn't always happen whenever i make attempts at silly little stories but the stories will have humor in them some of them will occasionally but not the majority of them uh they're, they they have common sense most of the parables that jesus teaches are on a common level that the common man is going to get, and he's going to, not necessarily he's going to get, but he's going to understand the relationship to it. The majority of these are agricultural based. You'll know this whenever you begin to process through your mind the parables that Jesus taught. They're speaking to, a, to an agricultural people who get, immediately the parable of the sower comes to mind. Uh, the, the ideas of, of the agriculture, the common man, the, getting and understanding these things. But ultimately, there is a, a strike in it. There is a striker component to the parable. And it is to teach the one who's hungry for the truth to dig deeper. The one who's not interested in digging deeper will simply walk away. That was such a good little story. I like it when he tells good little stories. They'll walk away even, according to, according to the Gospels, they'll even walk away confused and maybe even angry that Jesus would use such satire, such comparison to. So who's he talking about when he says that? Is he talking about me? So Matthew chapter 13, and we'll look at this parable in greater uh, Closeness. Right now, I just want to look at why Jesus, or I want to look at the explanation Jesus gives as to why he teaches with parables in these ways. So uh, let, 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 let's read verses one and following. So we'll have the parable on us. And then keep in mind right now, the emphasis of the examination of Matthew chapter 13 is not the parable. The emphasis that we want to see here is why is Jesus teaching in, para, in a parable and what is his answer? That he gives when the disciples say, hey, come on, how come you're doing this? So verse one, that day Jesus went out of the house and was sitting by the sea. And a large crowd gathered to him. 
And he got into a boat and he sat down and the whole crowd was standing on the beach. And he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, the sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell beside the road, and the birds came and, he ate, and, and ate them. Others fell on rocky places where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up because they had no depth of soil. But when the sun had risen, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. Others fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked them out. But the others, verse number eight, the others fell on good soil and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some 60, some 30. He who has ears, let him hear. Well, before we read any further, one has to ask the question, what does Jesus mean by he who has ears, let him hear? What does he want them to hear? Out of this story, does he just want them to go home and say, well, that was such a good comparison, this kind of soil, and that kind of soil. We get it, we're farmers. And sure enough, don't you know, whenever we're out sowing the seed, some of the some of the soil, some of the seed falls over here and it's great reward. And some of it falls over here. Yeah, I get it. You know, the horses walk on it, the, 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 the carts roll over it, it's hard, it's rocky, that's where the weeds are. I get it. That was such a good analogy. They go home. What was Jesus wanting them to hear? Ultimately, it needs to be part of the question. Well, hear, hear the dialogue before Jesus ever even gets to the explanation. Hear now the dialogue between the disciples and Jesus about why Jesus is teaching in parables. Verse number 10. And the disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? That's a pretty straightforward question. Why, why are you doing this, Jesus? And Jesus answered, answered them, to you it has been given, or to you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them, it has not been granted. Whoever has, to him more will be given. And, to, and, to he, and he will have an abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has shall be taken from him. Therefore, I speak to them in parables. Because while seeing, they do not see. And while hearing, remember Jesus said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. He's saying now, while hearing, they do not hear, nor do they comprehend or understand. So he's quoting from Isaiah in these coming passages, in these coming verses. In, the, in their case, the prophet Isaiah, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, you will keep on hearing but will not understand. You will keep seeing and will not receive. But the heart of his of this people has become dull. With their ears, they scarcely hear, and, and, they, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they would see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their heart and return. I and I would heal them. And blessed are your eyes because you see and your ears because you hear. For truly I say to you, that not many prophets, or that I say to you, that many prophets and righteous men desire to see what you see and did not see it, and hear what you hear and did not hear it. Now this is peculiar, actually. Because usually, again, when we hear someone utilizing the skill of the story, to communicate to people, usually in the circle of Christianity, we're hearing it misapplied. We're hearing people say, this guy's a great preacher. He tells the best stories. Everybody loves to hear him tell a story. And listen, I believe there really is a skill to it. And it is an attractive skill. But that's not what Jesus is utilizing the purpose of the story for. His purpose is really to speak to Christians who are in the audience of unbelievers. And he's speaking clearly through the parable to the believer and to the unbeliever. And this seems really strange, doesn't it? Jesus is to the self-righteous, to the, to, to the ungodly soul who's in the audience. 
so that I think part of this is so that he doesn't begin to convince himself he is a Christian. Jesus uses the parable so that they don't get it. That's strange, isn't it? Why would Jesus be so confusing to people? Isn't he teaching about the kingdom of heaven? Isn't it important that everyone who's present would hear these things and would, would then get it, what he's saying, so that they might understand? Well, Jesus' use of parables is, first of all, and first and foremost, is to fulfill prophetic word spoken about him. That we must grasp, first of all. Jesus didn't utilize the skill of the story because he thought this will really gather large crowds. This is so that the student of the Old Testament can see Jesus is using something. This is foretold of him that he would do this in this way. And it's foretold of him that when he utilizes the story, that there will be some in the crowd who will not get it. And those who do not get it, this is hard to swallow, isn't it? And they're not intended to get it. But that's very peculiar. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be better that Jesus speak in a much more clearer way that everyone could get it? I thought the purpose of the story was so that everyone could get it. Jesus is saying, no, it's really so that those who want to hear, those who want to see, they can and they will. Well, it, it, it does, it carries with it a very uh, unnerving, perhaps, at first glance, reality. Jesus is not utilizing the purpose of the parable to gather a larger crowd so that he might get them at the base level and then eventually hope that they will increase in their knowledge. Jesus is using the parable to speak primarily to the to those in the audience who are already who already get it, so that they might then look deeper into the things of God and not walk home going, "That was such a good little story." I get what he's saying. It's really so that they will. That some some of these parables will will force us to think, to process, to ponder. These, these parables, which by the way, this parable ought to, ought to unnerve you in all reality. When we study this parable, if it doesn't already unnerve you, at least from the human experience position of what mankind generally says and thinks about God, this parable should probably unnerve you when you get to the core of what Jesus is really saying. It's worth some examination, we'll, and, we'll, and we will. This one definitely will, will garnish, will, will, will require further examination for us. The text, Jesus goes further to explain it, um, and, and that's, that certainly will be to our benefit, it will be to the benefit of the disciples, in conclusion, though, let me at least bring back, bring us back to the, the last thing that Jesus said up in verse 13. It's not the last thing he says, but as, he's, as he finishes the parable, he speaks to the audience and says to them, he who has an ear to hear, he who has ears, let him hear. This isn't, this isn't cryptic language. It's not mysterious language. It's direct language to the follower. You understand what I'm saying. He's not saying to the farmer, you get this, don't you? Now let me tell you something different. He's saying to the believer, if, you, if, you're, if you're beginning to get it, you're hearing portions of this, go home and study this. If you're getting portions of this, stick around and let me tell you more. He's not speaking to the base position of, the, of, of everyone in the audience. He's speaking to a higher position to those, not, not, not to say intellectually higher, but to those who are in the spiritual, who are hungry and thirsty for righteousness, who are hungry and thirsty for knowledge of the, of the heavenly kingdom. And then as the disciples come to him, now this, this is interesting of the disciples. They'll come to Jesus from time to time questioning his methodologies. Isn't it interesting? 
No, no one today would dare think if you're if all you're wanting to do is gather a crowd and, and you have a skilled storyteller among you, no one's going to come and say, listen, you need to the people aren't getting your stories. Generally speaking, what's going to happen is people are going to they love your stories. Keep telling your stories. They laugh, they cry, they, 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 they well them up with emotion, they move them, they, 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 they do all kinds of things. These stories are beautiful, and we got a crowd here. The disciples are, are saying, hey, Jesus, these people don't get it. Why, why are you speaking like this? Don't, isn't there a better way that we could speak that more people would understand this? And Jesus wants them to understand. No, no, you don't understand this, obviously. This is very similar whenever the disciples come to Jesus. He's not speaking in a parable, but he's speaking in an analogy. He's speaking maybe perhaps more metaphorically when he says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. You remember what the disciples did after Jesus got done preaching that? Jesus, you got to quit talking like this. People think we're cannibals. People think we're nuts. We don't want people to talk like this about us when they go from here. They don't get it. Jesus, again, wasn't worried about the large crowd who's there. He's wanting to teach to the believer who's present. It really is pretty, pretty important for us to get. Now, is it possible for an unbeliever to hear this parable and to hunger for more? I would argue, yes, it is possible. And this individual is the one whom Jesus is speaking to, who's going to go home and search and dig deeper into the meaning of it. But he's not just going to walk home and, and applaud the skilled storyteller's way of telling a great little story. That person Jesus is not speaking to. That person is not hearing what Jesus is saying. That person is the Pharisee. That person is the ones who are on the who are on the periphery of this audience, and they their anger wells as Jesus teaches in such base ways. They don't like it. And they, and they, they begin to even, you, you even begin to understand why they begin to incite Jesus, why they begin to plot ways to shut him up and, to, and to eventually to crucify him. Because is, is Jesus saying, I'm the, the, the rocky soil? How dare he say that about me? To the believer, he says, oh, he's broken. If I'm, the, if I'm the rocky soil, then God change me and change my heart. But don't leave me a rocky soil. To the self-righteous, he gets in, in, in his indignation and anger wells against Jesus. How dare you say such a comparison to me? I'm not this soul. I'm the good soul. Soil, apparently. That's That's... That's how, this, that's how these parables and the intentionality of what Jesus is wanting to do. He's wanting to say something in a striking way so that the audience is struck with truth, not so they go home feeling so good about the story. Well, that's primarily the use of the parable in the New Testament. It is true of the Old Testament as well, but not nearly as... as uh, consecutively or consistently in the Old Testament. There's intentionality of the fable in the book of the Proverbs to, to bring common things and to compare them or to contrast them to spiritual things so that, so that we would get them, have understanding. Of them. But this is the parables. And uh, we want to spend time examining them. Uh, we'll, we'll start with a couple of the Old Testament ones over the next couple of weeks. Uh, and then we'll spend the majority of our time, as you can well see, the weight of the, of the parables in Scripture or in the New Testament, and that from Jesus. So we'll study those. Um, so before we, we, we uh, before I move into a couple of announcements and pray and conclude, do you have any questions or comments?